Paul said, I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. Now, the Greek word for disqualified here is actually the Greek word adokimos, which is a compound word. And the prefix a means not or without. And then dokimos means approval. So when you put those two together, it means not approved or without approval. Now, obviously, in the context of this verse, uh, Paul is talking about the athletics in Corinth. All of his readers would have been uh, very familiar with this because there was this huge uh, Ithmus Games, which is very similar to our Olympic Games. And everybody in Corinth understood that if certain athletes did certain things, they were a dokimos, which means they were disqualified, right? So that's the context as he's talking about running a race, things that people could do to be disqualified, right? Now, also in the broader context, this word was used for medals. Uh, they would stamp medals, a dokimos, if on the outside it was uh, uh, gold and silver and bright and whatnot, uh, but on the inside it was counterfeit. It was fake, right? And so they would say, ah, that's a dokimos. That is not approved. So what's the point here? Obviously, Paul thought that there was something that he could do that would disqualify him or disqualify future people from ministry. Now, look, unless you've been living under a rock, you know there's a lot of things that have been going on lately in terms of pastors falling, pastors stepping down, and it's going to continue to happen again and again. And uh, so what I want to do in this video is I want to ask the question and hopefully answer it, what exactly disqualifies a pastor from ministry, right? And is this qual disqualification a temporary disqualification? Is this a permanent disqualification? Well, I've got some good news and some bad news for you, okay? So the good news is that the Bible does give us very specific details and characteristics of what a pastor should be like. The bad news is that many of these things, as we're going to see, are very, very subjective or opinionated, while others are very objective. So we're not going to have time to touch on all of the different qualifications of an overseer, but we're going to touch on a few, the main ones. And then after we do go through these, I'm going to give you what I believe are some solid questions that we can all ask as it relates to whether this pastor should step down completely, like he's gone, he's out of here, or whether he should step away for a season and be allowed to return, all right? So let's jump into this. Okay, so the first one, and really we can lump all three of these together. Uh, in this passage in 1 Timothy chapter 3, it talks about an overseer needing to be above reproach, or also elsewhere it says they need to have a good reputation. It also says that people outside the church need to speak well of them, okay? Now, so once again, this is very, very subjective. What exactly does it mean to be above reproach? I mean, at the end of the day, as a matter of fact, one version says blameless, right? So what does this mean? Uh, how blameless do I need to be uh, above reproach, having a good reputation? Well, some people might think I'm good. Other people might think I'm, I'm you know, a jerk, right? Uh, so this idea of people outside the church speaking well of the pastor, once again, this is very subjective. You could talk to some people that, oh, that's the greatest guy in the community. You talk to other people and they're like, man, that guy is a snake, right? So what exactly does this mean above reproach? Let me give you an example. Look, I've been very candid with you guys that whenever I got married, I was not a virgin, right? Wish I was, but I wasn't. Does that disqualify me from ministry? Am I now all of a sudden not above reproach because of the sins of my past? Well, I'll tell you what this doesn't mean. Let's just say that you had a very, very sinful life before you came to Christ. I mean, it was horrible, very sinful. And then you came to Christ and you want to be a pastor. Well, guess what? Nothing that you did before you came to Christ disqualifies you from ministry. How do I know? Because we can look at the great apostle Paul, who we could argue was used by God more than any other man throughout human history. And we know his past as it relates to him being a persecutor of the church. So no, nothing that you've done before Christ 
is enough to disqualify you permanently from ministry. So to me, this one is a little bit subjective. So let's move on to the next one. So the next one says that he should be the husband of one wife. And most people interpret this to mean like a one woman man, in other words, faithful to his wife. Now, this one is not subjective, right? This is objective. Are you faithful or are you not? That's like, you can't be a little bit pregnant. You're either pregnant or you're not, right? So are you faithful or are you not? Have you been faithful or have you had some sort of indiscretion, right? So it is my opinion that if there is a sin of adultery that has not been confessed, and let's just say this thing happened many, many years ago, but now it's coming up, you've confessed it, you're going through the repentance process, which you can make an argument that you really haven't repented at all. If this thing happened many, many years ago and you haven't brought it up to anybody, that could be a sign that you really have been walking in a hypocritical life. So when these things come up, it is in my opinion that that pastor needs to at least step away for a season to get healed and get restored. And we'll talk about whether they can return a little bit later. Now, I'll be honest with you. Some people will interpret this passage literally and they will say, hey, look, if at any time in this pastor's marriage, he has been unfaithful to his wife, he needs to permanently step down from ministry. He is not fit to be a pastor. And you know what? I'm not going to argue with people who interpret it that way. They obviously see it that way. They have a right to see it that way. Exegetically, I could definitely see where they get there. And that's the reason why we have to be so careful, because as you've heard me say before, there is forgiveness in Christ but there are consequences to our decisions. In other words, we can choose our sin, but we cannot choose our consequences. And one consequence of adultery very well may be at least a temporary disqualification from ministry. Okay, the next few, self-control, being gentle and not quarrelsome. So if a pastor demonstrates a, uh, a, a history a repeated pattern of mistreating the people that serve under him, that pastor needs to be stepping down. I'm sorry, because you should not be treated. This is a character issue, and this is a clear violation of 1 Timothy 3. So if people in your church have observed over time that you are treating people in a domineering, in a condescending way, you're disrespectful, disrespecting them in terms of how you're dealing with them, very similar to this clip right here of Rod Parsley that recently came out not too long ago. Mixtures in the right place for the camera shots. Yes, sir. Could we wake up? Yes, sir. And you people want to go to Israel and do a shoot? You can't do one on the property. Why am I bringing volunteers out here to do your own stuff? My granddad died last Saturday. Don't you look for boys to be here. Stay home. You want to go home? Who called me? Megan. Yeah, you didn't. Right, they called me. But right. I, was in, I was in the meeting. I'm so here's how we. Okay. I know who called me because I told them to. Yes. Because I knew you wouldn't. And you didn't. But we're ready for baptism. No, you're not. I can walk. No, you're not. Well, let me walk it through you. It would take me 10 minutes to prove to you that you're not. Okay, then. Whatever you say, sir. Are you being smug with me? No, I'm not. I'm saying whatever you Don't. I'm not being smug. No, I'm not. Don't. I'm not. One more person grins at me, one more person smirks at me in this room, it will be the last one of you that does it. The money that is being spent in this room is obscene for what I'm getting. Obscene. I hire people to run entire sections of this place, not hold their hand through a baptism. Much less what I just went through. Don't, are you ever going to learn not to back talk me? Because it's been a year and you still haven't learned. So if this has been a pattern as a leader, that leader needs to step away so that they can experience some sort of humiliation plan so that they can get restored first and foremost in their relationship with Christ, but then ultimately possibly return back to ministry. Okay, he must manage his household well. What does that mean? I mean, at the end of the day, like, does that mean if you have a wayward child, 
that you've raised that child the best you can as a Christian parent, and that child uh, takes a turn, their life takes a turn for, for the worse, that you're supposed to be not able to preach? You see what I'm saying? Like, you see where I'm going with this? Like, some of this stuff is very, very subjective. So I'm supposed to be punished because of the decisions of my children? Okay, the next one, violent. Now, this one to me is not subjective. Once again, this is objective. If a man has at any time been physically abusive towards his wife or his kids, he needs to step down from ministry, period. There is no place in ministry for a man who has expressed any sort of abuse, specifically physical or, you know what I'm saying, all right, S-A, all right, I hope y'all know what that means, uh, S-A, all right, uh, if that's the type of abuse that they have experienced or uh, displayed in some way, they are not fit for ministry, they need to step down. All right, heavy drinkers, does this mean a pastor has one beer, he's a heavy drinker, he has five beers a week, he's then a heavy drinker, like, you see what I'm saying, like, some of this stuff is very, very vague, it's, it's not like Paul gives you an exact list of if you do any of these things, you are disqualified. Now, here's one that is subjective, but probably shouldn't be able to teach, right? So if you are a pastor and you are clearly consistently not um, teaching the word of God according to proper hermeneutical principles, like you're not interpreting the Bible, taking verses out of context, you're not fit to be pastoring. You don't have any training. You need to be set down. Now, once again, this is subjective because you talk to some people in the congregation. They're like, hey, man, that pastor preaches. Don't man, you know, absolutely. I believe everything he says. You speak to other people outside the church. They may call him a heretic. So once again, this is very, very subjective. Okay. So I've made my point, right? Like, yes, Paul's list. We always go to that. First Timothy three, first Timothy three. But I think we can all agree here that to some degree that many of these are very subjective and some of them are very objective. So uh, what I want to do is I want to give you a few big questions that we can ask ourselves as it relates to whether this pastor should step down, step away, whether they can be restored to ministry uh, at some point or not. Okay, let's jump in. Question number one, has this pastor fully repented of their sin or are they just really, really sorry that they got caught in it? Okay, what might this look like? Well, for starters, it means that that pastor or that leader is taking full, total responsibility for their actions without making excuses, without blaming it on someone else, without uh, trying to downplay it, without um, you know trying to uh, uh, phrase it in a way that makes them look better, trying to save face. Anytime you see any of those things, that means that pastor has not repented and therefore is not fit for ministry. They need to step down. It also could mean that in certain situations that that pastor needs to make full restitution for the damage that they caused. And then obviously it means a complete and total change in your mind about this sin leading to a change in behavior. So in other words, if the pastor is not willing to repent or not willing to surrender or give up this particular sin, like they want to hold on to this relationship or they want to hold on to this lifestyle, that's not repentance. That pastor is not fit. He needs to step down. And then finally, if that pastor is not willing to submit himself to an extended period or season of uh, uh essentially pastoral restoration, healing, not even for the point of being restored to the pastorate, but just so they can improve on their relationship with God. If they're not willing to submit to that plan, they're not repented. They need to be removed from ministry. Okay, now this second question is gonna answer a lot of the questions that you may have, and that is the fact that is this a sin that the trust of the church, the congregation, the community cannot really be regained. When you have a sin that is so egregious that if I'm being honest, like it's very, very difficult for the church and the community to regain respect for you because it was so deep in that situation. And I'm going to go out on a limb and say it. I know some people are going to be angry with me but I'm going to take a stand. I think that might permanently disqualify someone from ministry permanently. When you have a situation that is, that is so, so harmful and so egregious that 
people cannot look at you anymore and see the Christ in you. All they see is the sin all over you. Trust cannot be regained. And in that situation, your sin becomes a distraction to the ministry because people are not going to be able to receive the word of God from you because the first thing they see is this huge cloud of sin that was so egregious that that's what they see. And so if your sin is, if your name is notorious for the sin that you committed to where trust cannot be regained, my friends, I'm sorry, that might permanently disqualify you from ministry. Third question, is this a one-time violation or is this a repeated pattern? Now, this one is very, very important. Don't skip past this, right? So let's just say a man has an affair on his wife. Okay, cool. Uh, well, not cool, but uh, let's just say that, that he has this affair. All right, so is this a one-time situation? Okay, if that's the case, then maybe that pastor steps down and uh, for a very extended period of time gets the healing that they need in terms of processing everything, how it happened, uh, all the different things that led up to that, because oftentimes these things are not hap don't happen in a vacuum. There's a series of things that are going on in that pastor's life that led up to this, that they need to unpack and, and, and unpeel to make sure they've, they're dealing with all of it. If they've dealt with all of that over extended period of time, then maybe they can return, right? Now, if somebody has a repeated pattern of this, Let's just say you find out that your pastor has been cheating on his wife for the last 20 years. To me, that would be in the category of egregious. And let me explain why. Because that shows that there has been a extreme pattern of a lack of repentance, which is now a huge character issue that you can lead a double life. You can lead a hypocritical life for 15 or 20 years, come here preaching the pulpit and preaching the word of God and you have this secret sin that you're dealing with all this time. To me, that's more of a repeated pattern than a one-time situation, which is a deeper issue, which once again would be much more difficult for people to regain your trust. Fourth question, have other trusted spiritual leaders deemed this person fit to return to ministry? My friends, I cannot stress this enough. This is the reason why when churches appoint people for elders, it's a serious deal, right? People, this is where elders, the board of elders comes in, in situations like this. So if the board of elders has uh, gone through this process of healing and repentance and restoration, and if that church and that board of elders has come together and they believe wholeheartedly that this man has truly repented of their sin, excluding some of the egregious things that I talked about before that I personally believe that they're just, they're just permanently disqualified. But in other situations like, you know, uh, misusing money or, uh, uh, you know, uh, lack of self-control in meetings, going off on people, or even maybe some sort of, uh, inappropriate relationship or something like that. But this person has tr the, the elders of the church truly believe this person is fit for ministry and they can return then by all means, maybe that's a situation where that pastor can return to ministry. But the idea here is that I don't know how long this is in terms of how long it needs to be, but however long it is, it needs to be obvious to everyone on the elder board that there is contrition as it relates to this person that they have truly repented. And then a final question is, is this sin a distraction for the minister? Now, this is something that only the minister can answer, but let me explain uh, and give you an example. Let's just say you have a pastor and they are struggling uh, with watching uh, inappropriate websites, adult entertainment. I think you know what I'm talking about with me not having to, you know, use words that we all know what we're talking about here, right? So if that's the, the struggle that the pastor is having, there is no possible way that that pastor is going to be able to stand before the people every Sunday and deliver the word of God under the spirit of God and give the people the spiritual food and nourishment that they deserve because their heart is so corrupted with all of this filth 
And what's happening is they are robbing the, the, the congregation of the spiritual food that they deserve because their sin, if they're honest about it, is a huge distraction to themselves and their ability to adequately minister the word of God. When this is present in a minister's life, he needs to be humble enough to say, you know what, I'm unfit and I need to step down because this is a huge distraction for my ministry. So I know that this may not answer all of your questions. As you clicked on this video, you might want to get a clear uh, your list of things. But here's the thing, guys. As I said earlier, uh, the Bible does give us qualifications for a minister, but many of them are subjective. Some of them are very, very objective. Not only that, um, the Bible has no examples of a man permanently being disqualified from ministry that we can point to and say, oh, well, that man did that in the Bible, so therefore, uh, you know, we need to uh, 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 follow that, right? So what we have to do in these situations is we have to be balanced and we have to make sure that we're not speaking where the scriptures have not spoken. And we have to understand that this is a very nuanced situation. And as a result, uh, there are many, many different uh, opinions and interpretations of this. Some are very, very clear and others leave a little bit of room for questions one way or the other. So what are your thoughts? All right. Do you think that certain ministers are temporarily disqualified? Do you think that they're permanently disqualified? And if so, what do you think about what I shared in this video in terms of the scriptures, uh, in terms of things that were going that were going on in our society today <laughs> with all the craziness? Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. As always, keep it civil. I'll see you in the next video. Bye for now.